This is Xander, everyone. He's going to talk today about divisors and maps. All right. So the first thing, so yesterday we talked a little bit about affine and projective varieties and what it means for something to be smooth and what it means for something to be a curve. Ultimately, what we're building up to is the riemann roch theorem, which what it really tells us about is maps from a curve to projective space. And it tells us about where all these maps come from and what their structure is and which projective spaces they land in. Which is great because in particular it can be used to tell us about embeddings in the projective space, which are very important and they allow us to take our curve and actually put coordinates on it and talk explicitly about these things. But before we can get to any of that, we have to actually spend a little bit of time talking about maps themselves. Um, so the first idea that I want to get to is divisors. And I'm going to motivate this a little bit by saying, let's say we have Let's say we've got a curve that goes something like this, and we've got another curve down here, which maybe is just a P1. We, we, we just have a line, and there's a map between them, which we can think of really as just projecting away from this axis. So the objects that I'm going to define in a moment, which are called divisors, what we should think of them as are fibers of maps of curves. So, so for instance, if I want to look at the fiber of this map, let's call it F. I'll call it V, because I think it's better to keep F for a polynomial in case we need one. The fiber above this point is going to be this point and this point. Let's see, there are six of them. OK, so I could give these all names. Maybe I'll call them P1, P2. And we could choose maybe a different point over, over here. I should have done this a little bit here. I'm going to actually change this. Because the thing I just drew doesn't really make sense. The fibers should all have the same cardinality as the thing. So the fact that we had six points over here and only four over here doesn't really work. And let's see, I think I want to have... an extra little bulb that lives right there. That should work. OK, so now maybe I pick this point, and we've got these four. And well, if I pick this point right here, I only have three. And that's obviously, I mean, we, we want things like this to be continuous and be really robust. And when we wiggle a little bit, crazy things shouldn't happen to our fibers. So we need more information than just a set of points right here. You might imagine that there are actually two copies of this particular point, so two times whatever our point is. Because you can see we have two branches coming together. So if I if I had picked a point, if I had picked a point just a little bit off to its right, I would have one, two, three, four, and then as I slid over, two of them came together. And the way we're gonna keep track of this data. Um, a divisor on a curve C is an integer linear combination <coughs> of its points. So the divisor that we're going to associate to this fiber right here will be P3 plus P4 plus P5 plus P6. And those numbers are a little bit weird because I got rid of two of those points earlier. Is, but this, like, is this purely formal or is there some... This is totally formal. Okay. This is... There's no there's, like secret group law or something. There's like no this. relations among here anywhere. We're never going to have like P5 plus P7 equal to P3 or something like that. This is all totally formal, just linear combinations with integer coefficients. Um, so over here we'll have a fiber, the divisor associated to this fiber is going to be P1, P2, and I guess I have to call this P7. So here we have P1 plus P2 times 2 plus P7. So 
The maps that we're interested in, though, are not just maps from one curve to another, but maps from a projective space. Or sorry, rather, maps from a curve to a projective space. And there, we're going to need to do something a little bit differently. So let's say we have a map from our curve to some PN. Um, the, the main observation here, which is actually a very special and kind of surprising fact, is that there's actually going to be a curve inside of PN which is the image of this map. So this is a really surprising fact when you think about it, because this is absolutely not true if we were talking, for instance, about um, smooth manifolds. If I had, I mean, I can write down some crazy space-filling map from, from a smooth curve to, uh, to R2 that flies all over the place and covers the entire plane, but we absolutely cannot do that here, no matter what our map, if it's a map that's given by polynomials, so if it's an algebraic map, its image is going to be a curve inside of Pn. And we can think of it in this way. Um, and what we're going to do is, rather than looking at the fiber above a point, like we did when we had a map of curves, the thing is most points aren't even going to have a fiber. But if we take a hyperplane over here, intersect it with this curve. So that's going to give us a divisor on this. So here, I'll, I'll write this down. We'll take a hyperplane in Pn. And all of this for right now is going to seem very formal, and it's going to seem like it's not going anywhere. And then I'm going to do a lot of examples, and we'll see that this is actually describing something really important and really interesting. But We'll take a hyperplane, intersect H with the image. And since this is a curve and this is a hyperplane, I won't exactly go through the details of this, but you can imagine that when it happens to be tangent to, to C prime, we can get some multiplicity. And this thing is actually going to be It gives a divisor on C prime rather than just a collection of points. And then finally, using this construction that I sort of waved my hands about, we can pull each of those points back, multiply it by their appropriate multiplicity, and we get form a divisor on C. By taking fibers. You have to be a bit careful that C, does, C prime doesn't lie in H. Yeah, that's true. Um, that won't come up in any of our examples, but in, in general, if we wanted to prove, if we wanted to write down theorems and actually prove them carefully, that's something we would need to watch out for. So if, if C is contained in H, so remember the definition that we gave of a curve yesterday. Um, Curve is a variety such that uh, for any other variety x, x cap c is either all of c or a finite set. So as long as C is not contained in our hyperplane, we don't have to worry about this case. So we'll always actually get a finite set, and we can talk about a divisor that we get on C prime. But in general, that is something that we need to watch out for. OK, so now let's, let's write down some maps and do some examples. And the first thing, the first thing that I'm going to go back to, just because it's something that's, that's very easy to write down, and and draw a picture of is a hyperelliptic curve. So y squared minus, let's pick a big polynomial. I'll do what I did last time. 
0 to 8 of x minus i. So this is a polynomial with roots at every integer between 0 and 8. It has 9 roots. And what we do, we're graphing its square root, basically. So that's going to look like whenever this function is positive, we'll have two branches. When it's negative, there are no branches. Should move this over, actually. And it alternates between positive and negative at each integer up to 8, when it eventually stays positive and goes all the way off. So this is our curve. And the map that we're going to talk about, and this lives in A2, which is actually just the same thing as C2, but with a funny name. And we're going to talk about this projection map. So inside of A2 is a copy of A1. Is we have a line running right through the middle of it, and we're actually just going to project right down onto it. And this gives us a map from C to A1 that takes a point x, y, and just projects it onto its x-coordinate. Now I'm going to go back through here and make a slight change. I'm going to put all of this stuff in projective space. So I need to stick a z over here. So now this is homogeneous of degree 9. Stick a z to the 7th over there. This now lives in P2. And it's got a P1 running through the middle of it. Everything else still works exactly the same, except that. So a point over here is now given by x, y, and z, which satisfy this polynomial. And we're still just throwing out the y coordinate. Whoops. Want that to be p1? Yeah. P1, yes, thank you. OK. So the fibers of this map, any pick, almost any point we choose will be exactly the same, not exactly the same set of points, but pretty much the same thing. It'll be, if I choose a point like this, we'll have one pair of sort of opposite points. There's a, there's a symmetry of this curve that flips across the axis, and all the fibers are symmetric, and all the fibers are exactly two points, except for nine of them. At these nine points, we get 2 times that point. And the way you can see this is that we are picking. So, so a hyperplane on P1 is actually just a point. So we're taking a point right here. This map is surjective. So this right here is inequality. We don't have to worry about intersecting our hyperplane with that at all. We're just multiplying. We're just taking that point and trying to figure out what its fiber is, and if we wiggled it a little bit to either side, we would have two points. So probably it should be 2 times p. Although, again, we're not really defining these things very rigorously, so that's not much of an argument. But this is, this is our first example. Um, now, there's one extra point down here, which is the point at infinity. So, so out here on p1, there's one missing point. And when we pull that one back, we get two copies of the fiber over that is two copies of the point at infinity on our curve. So actually, there are 10 points that have this weird property where the points come together. Nine of them we can see really clearly, and then the one extra one is way off at infinity. Um, so the point that I'm going to try to make as I go through all these examples is that Whenever you have a map to projective space, we have a way to get lots of divisors on our curve from it, just by pulling back different points. I want to show you that for the most part, every divisor, well, I want to show you that lots of divisors show up in this way, 
and that we can use divisors on their own to talk about maps to projective space. Um, so, let me see here, I need to find my examples. Okay. So one last thing that I want to point out about this particular thing is that we know that in projective space we can scale by whatever we want without, without changing the points we're talking about. So let's scale by uh, let's scale by z. So we had a z there before, so now we have a 1. Here we have an x over z, and I want to point out that if we think of these two things as functions on our original curve, um, this, this, think about this for a second. You know what, I'm going to come back to this actually in a few minutes because I think that there's a better example to talk about first. Are you going to need to introduce us to like at least an extra case for either your yeah for another point at infinity if you're going to scale by z here? There's only one point at infinity in this picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Did I understand that? Maybe. I might. Not, I'm okay. Hopefully, fine. it'll make sense later. And yeah. if it doesn't, feel free to ask that question again because sure. I'm not sure that I understood it. So, the next example I'm going to do is the squaring map, which is a map from P1 to P1 that takes We'll just square both of the coordinates. And if we want to, so, so P1 is actually a copy of the, the complex plane with one extra point at infinity added. So really it's, it's some kind of a sphere. And basically what we're doing is we're keeping these opposite points fixed and stretching everything around itself twice. Um, but in particular, just like over there, Every fiber is going to have two points on it, if we count them correctly, because every complex number has two square roots. Um, we can scale this again, just like we did before. Let's get let's get a one in there, and we will. So we've got this map between P1s, um, and this is not really a very great drawing of it because it's stretching around itself in some strange way, but at most points, the fiber is going to be, so let's call this, uh, the coordinates of this point are alpha and beta. And I'm going to look at just choosing any branch of the square root function. And then also, so the thing I'm writing down right now is a divisor. So we have two different points. If we chose the negative square root for both of them, that would actually give us the same point as this, because we've just scaled by a negative 1. So we have two points in the fiber, except at 0. At 0, we get 2 times 0. At infinity, we get 2 times infinity. And I should put brackets around that 0 so that it's clear that 2 times 0 is not just 0. Um, and the functions that show up here, so when we actually write down the map, and I scaled it so that there's a 1 in one of these coordinates, the functions that we get, if we think about them on P1, they, this one right here is not defined everywhere on P1. 
one, right? So when I had it written down like this, this expression was good everywhere. Because one of s and t is always going to be non-zero. One of these is always going to be non-zero, and these are defined everywhere. This one blows up when t is equal to zero. It has a pole of order two way out at infinity. So I'm going to make one more definition here. For a divisor d, we define, I'm going to define a vector space, L of d, which is the set of all, um, and this is on a curve c, the set of all rational functions f such that And let's say if D is, so all of these NP are going to be positive. And then also we might have some negative terms. The rational function such that uh, I want to give these different names. And I need a little bit more room to write this down, so I'll put it in. Rational functions f on c, and I'm not quite defining what I mean by rational function, but let's just suffice it to mean something kind of like this, where it almost looks like it's given by polynomials, except in this case, you know, it actually does look like it's given by a rational function, but it won't always look like that. But it's an expression that's not defined everywhere. Such that f vanishes to order at least np at each p. So when we have a positive coefficient, we're putting a requirement on. We're saying it has to vanish at least this much. When we have a negative coefficient, sorry, I did that backwards, to at least mq at each cube. So the negative coefficients are giving us requirements. The positive coefficients are giving us sort of allowance. So blows up to order less than or equal to np. Um, at each p. So Negative coefficients are requiring zeros. Positive coefficients are allowing poles. And we can see that both of these functions that show up as the coordinates of our map, one and s squared mod t squared, one has no poles or zeros anywhere. t squared has a pole of order two at infinity. So both of these are in the vector space associated to um, 2 times infinity, which was the thing that we got by pulling back the point at infinity. This has a pull of at worst order 2. And this vector space is called the Riemann rope space of D. All right, I'm going to talk about a couple more examples here before I finally state the Riemann rope theorem.
which tells us basically it's going to be a formula for the dimension of this space. Um, okay, so a curve that came up as one of our examples yesterday. is this one. Uh, which lives in, so it lives in A3, but let's just pretend that it lives in P3. That way I don't have to stick in a fourth variable to make everything, to make everything rigorous. So there's a map from P1 to P3 that takes Ts to here. I'm going to write this down actually on one of the affine parts first. It takes T to, we're going to want Did I do that right? If this is x, okay, x squared. That's right. That's right? Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I, I think. z, no, z is not equal to x squared right now. Here, I'll switch. Switching y and x up here should fix it, though, I think. So now we have no. Shouldn't no. you? Shouldn't you just the z, z, z? What do I have written? The y should z should be t, or z should be in the left one. Z should be x, right? You want? Are you? Wait. <laughs> the twist and cube. I'm sorry about this. The twist and cube is x minus. Z. Z should definitely be uh, okay. I'm gonna write this and then I'm gonna make that correct. So if this has z minus x cubed, y minus x squared. And that's the curve we're gonna use. Okay, so here's the map from A1 to A3. This extends in a pretty straightforward way to a map from P1 to P3 that's going to go S cubed, S squared T, ST squared, and then T cubed. So this is all the monomials of degree 3. And when we scale s to be equal to 1, so when we look only at this part, then we're getting a 1, which is just a constant, so we can forget about it, t, t squared, and t cubed. So it really is an extension of this map. And when we pull back the point at infinity, or rather when we, when we take the hyperplane at infinity in p3 and intersect it with this curve, my claim is that it's actually, and I, I won't go through the details of this, but it shouldn't be very surprising that it will hit it with multiplicity 3. Because, yeah, it shouldn't be very surprising, but I won't. We would, we would need to be a little bit more rigorous about what we mean by that for me to actually prove it. So um, let's call this map phi, phi inverse of infinity is three times the point at infinity on our curve. And again, I'm going to scale all these so that we have a one, one. Um, so what am I, I'm dividing through by s cubed, uh, t squared over s squared, t 
cubed over s cubed. Each of these functions has a pole of order at most three at infinity. So all of them uh, s cubed. These all live in the Riemann rope space of that divisor. In fact, they're a basis for it. Um, we could probably prove that right now, but in the next few minutes, we'll have a much easier way to prove it because we'll be able to compute the dimension of this space. Um, and it's pretty easy to see that these are linearly independent. So once we know that it's four-dimensional, we're done. Um, but the, so the fact that I am trying to get across is that given a divisor D on a curve, if L of D is fairly big, namely, actually, if L of D is not zero, so if there are any rational functions that satisfy these conditions, this divisor is giving us some conditions on rational functions, if anything at all satisfies it, then we can get a map from C to P dim LD minus 1. If we were being pedantic, actually, it would be P of LD, but I'm writing everything out in coordinates anyway, so this doesn't matter. Um, that takes a point P and sends it to if, let's say, if this is a basis for that vector space, then we'll just evaluate all of those functions at our point. Together, they'll give us a point of this most of the time. It actually is not always true. So for instance, some of these might blow up at various points. They might all vanish all together all at once. And in both of those cases, we don't actually get a point up here. But um, either today or on Friday, I'll talk about when this actually does give a map that's defined everywhere. But the point is that we can always write down this map. It will always be defined on most of C. It can fail at at most finitely many points. And it has the property that, um, I'll call it phi of D. If we pull back the hyperplane at infinity, It'll spin us back our original divisor. Okay. Is the preimage of phi? Yes. Thank you. So now, I'm going to state the main theorem that we've been working towards so far. Which says this. Actually, here, I'm going to write down one quick lemma, first of all. which is just kind of an important observation for understanding why the next theorem makes any sense at all, which is that if C is a projective curve and uh, D is a divisor, then L of D is 
always finite dimensional. In fact, this is literally always false. Um, or not literally always, because there are going to be some divisors with no sections at all, but it fails very, very frequently on affine curves. So for instance, if we were talking about A1, and we wanted to talk just about the divisor 0. So we're not putting any requirements, but we're also not allowing any poles. L of B is the vector space of all polynomials. They're all there, so, so in particular, L of D is an infinite dimensional vector space. But on a projective curve, this is kind of a cool fact, this vector space is always going to be finite dimensional. So if I had been being careful over here, I should have said, choose a finite dimensional subspace of LD, put this all together, find a basis for that, put it all together, and then you get this. Because in the case that C is not projective, this might not actually make sense, because that could be an infinite dimensional space. Um, in all of our applications, we're only really going to care about projective curves. So, so this construction will always work exactly as I wrote it down. And then the theorem, holding all the same hypotheses. Uh, if the degree of D, by which I mean uh, if D is going to be If d is going to be uh, the sum of some points with some coefficients, then its degree is actually just the sum of all the coefficients. If this is greater, ooh crap, I need to say something else first. There exists an integer, g associated to this curve, it doesn't depend on anything other than the curve, called the genus. Such that if the degree of our divisor is bigger than 2 to the minus 2, then the dimension of L of D is exactly the degree of D plus 1 minus G. Matt, did you define the degree of divisor? Yes. Oh. oh, I defined it and then I erased it two seconds okay. later. So, All right, hey, sorry. Degree of D, which is the sum of these. Thank you for pointing that out. Because I did write it down and then I needed to add this statement about the genus, so I erased it and forgot to put it back in. Are those NPs specifically the positive coefficients? Or all of them. All, all of them. the coefficients, yeah. Um, all the examples I wrote down, our coefficients were all positive. Yeah. Um, if we were interested in something like, and this isn't going to come up in any of our applications, but think about this map from A1 to A1 that takes T to 1 over T. In this case, looking at it naively, the fiber above zero looks like it should be empty. Um, but in fact, the fact that there's a pole here, we, we would put a negative coefficient there. Basically, if, if when you see a negative coefficient in a fiber, it's referring to the fact that the function is undefined and there's a pole coming up. But, all the functions that I wrote down were defined everywhere on the entire curve, so when we took the fibers, everything was always positive. Okay. Or non-negative, I should say, because there were lots of zero coefficients. Um, so, what time is it? Okay, I've got a few more minutes. So I want to say... I want to save, I think I'll save all the applications for Friday. I'm going to say a couple words right now about where this 2g minus 2 comes from. Um, 
which is that basically there is another divisor. There's a, there's a special divisor on this curve, which is usually denoted by a k. And this will come up a bit more on Friday. But, um, sometimes there's a subscript C, and sometimes people leave it off. On C, called the canonical divisor, such that we actually have something a little bit better than this. We don't need this condition that the degree is bigger than 2g minus 2, and we always have the degree of d plus 1 minus g plus the dimension of the riemann rilke space of k minus d. And the degree of k is exactly 2g minus 2. And if d is a divisor This part two is almost a totally separate statement, but with negative degree, then L of D is always the zero space. And this is basically the reason for this is that uh, the number of zeros and poles of a rational function always have to add up to zero. Um, so if we're requiring too many zeros without allowing some poles to balance them out, you just can't have a rational function that satisfies it. And then, in this case, when the degree of d gets bigger than 2g minus 2, this whole term over here goes away. Um, because of the fact that this divisor inside here will have negative degree. It'll be 2g minus 2 minus the degree of d, which is negative. Um, so that's all I'm going to say for today. And on Friday, we're going to use the riemann rilke theorem to define a special subset of a curve called the Weierstrass points and use that thing to prove um, that most curves only have finitely many automorphisms, which is just kind of a cool theorem because it allows us to classify all the different curves that have group structures. All right. So. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, yeah, and your definition, is that intentionally plural? Or? That is not intentionally plural. There is more than one of them. It's not uniquely defined, okay. but, but that's not really important. Yeah, that was supposed to be singular. Any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks.